All right, uh, so good morning. My name is Michael. I'm a logaholic. Hello, my name is Michael. I'm a logaholic. I have to make sure you're listening, so there are some tests in here. You will be questioned. Uh, how many people here have actually played with, looked at, or know about these cheat sheets? Good. Everybody should be raising their hands because this is uh, really good stuff. It's reference SANS training materials. Uh, the MITRE ATT&CK that I'm about to talk about, it is referenced in there as well. I'm also co-creator of LogMD, as he mentioned. Um, so with Log and Malicious Discovery, you'll see a little bit about that, but that's not what this talk's about. And then uh, anybody here listen to Breaking Down Security podcast with Brian, Brian, and Amanda? And Brian and I have the Breaking Down Incident Response, so please listen to that as well. We try to make it very actionable about what you can do at work. How many talks start out with telling you there's homework? Okay. Uh, so you will. This is a big topic. Um, and there is homework because, oddly enough, this week and last month, a lot happened in this topic. Um, earlier, I was invited to go to a TACCON in D.C. this week, uh, but I promised to be here, and I think giving education is a priority. Um, so homework is, and I only have 50 minutes, and it's hard enough to talk 50 minutes, let alone for a couple hours. So listen to the podcast. We just had Katie on from MITRE on BDIR. And so you'll get a gist of what MITRE is from MITRE's perspective and what questions we asked her. So there's a podcast to listen to. The other is uh, when SANS publishes these videos, I really recommend you do that. I submitted a talk to SANS Thur. No idea what the slant would be other than threat hunting and incident response. There were 17 talks. 12 of them had MITRE attack in them. Uh, fortunately, I was second up, so there's no way I could have known this. And the fact that I just sat through, you know, I was just like, wow, we all seem to have come to the same conclusion. Um, so I, I thought that was really cool. But those videos are definitely, there were some great talks. So when they come out, uh, my PDF is published on Maori Archaeology. This presentation's already published on Maori Archaeology. So read those and potentially watch the videos. And then MITRE TACCON was this week, Tuesday, Wednesday. And those videos are posted on YouTube. They're in four hour chunks. Uh, so by all means, please watch these. They will really fill in a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today and expand your understanding of attack because uh, much like maybe the cyber kill chain became a big thing, um, this kicks that ass uh, in regards to usefulness. So let's talk about, um, so why do we care? People ask me all the time, you know, how do you, how do you know what to look for? Of course, the first thing I always tell them is it's my experience, right? All these years I've been doing this and fighting the Chinese in the gaming industry and being a consultant at HP, it's my experience. But, you know, because, because th that's not good enough. You can't just say, well, because I said so, um, which a lot of us do. We tell people because, you know, my experience that says, hey, and, and sometimes that's arrogant of us to say, well, because I know what I'm talking about, just do it. Um, and of course, the malware management framework, I wrote this six years ago as an outcome of fighting the Chinese. And, and people say, well, how did you build that environment from nothing? Uh, what, was the, what was the trigger for that? I said, well, I took the reports from um, the, the incident response firms that have written stuff about APT. I looked at all the you know, Dooku and Shamu, uh, all those things. And I said, all right, what are the unique things in there that they are doing? Not to mention commodity malware's typical reports that we see. Um, and what is it that they did that I'm not looking for, either in a Windows event log, a security tool I already have, a big fix query, whatever. And I mapped all the things that I found in these reports, which I referenced as the malware management framework, to how I trigger stuff. And then my experience, and because I said so to myself, because you know we always talk to ourselves when we're doing our thing. And, and again, also, how do most of you do this? Well, a lot of you are driven by PCI or OWASP, compliance stuff, right? This is web app sec. I mean, you guys literally read and have to breathe OWASP to deal with how to do secure development, how to do the secure logging. OWASP has a page on how to develop logging within an application, for example. And a lot of us do it, and Wendy Mather has said this in, in talks in the past, uh, how many people here would have not been better off if they didn't have compliance shoved down their throat? It's an argument or debate to have, but a lot of people got better solely because of compliance. Um, and again, because InfoSec and WebAppSec, you know, all of us at, here at OWASP and all of us at B-Sides and DerbyCon say, you have to do this. Um, but it's a combination of all this, right? It's kind of everything. It's our experiences. It's, it's, it's compliance. It's what we're told to do, what we think we should do. But the cool thing is you want to identify your gaps, right? That is the ultimate goal here when we're trying to figure out how to improve our infrastructure and try to do better at our jobs and enhance our resumes and all the things involved with that. And again, whether you're a consultant or an employee, you can define potential budget needs if you can define those gaps. I don't have coverage here, so I'm going to 
find my gaps, which is what gap assessments do. They basically determine, as a consultant, we go in, we do gap assessments, we say, you, you're really bad at logging on the internet, you couldn't detect a brute force for the life of you. Um, or, you know, again, you have to admit that a tool you have is no longer functioning to the level you think it is, <coughs> AV. Um, and so you look for some alternative to that. Um, and so you have to admit that something you bought and, and wanted budget for prior is no longer working for you. And again, budget reallocation to me is a real bonus. I have sat through many vendor talks where they say, can I replace my AV with this? So budget reallocation is important here because it's a selling point for you to get better. And you have to identify the fact or accept the fact that you, you are going to admit your tools aren't as good as they could be. They were when you got them or recommended them, but things have changed, right? And again, your goal is to improve your security posture, period. So MITRE ATT&CK is your new baseline. It's the place to start. And, and you heard me, okay, it is the place to start, right? This is your thing. We finally have a goal to, to what to achieve, what to achieve. Not exactly how, but what to achieve. And you can map attack, and you will do this, you'll pass uh, or exceed any compliance requirements. So for example, which you're gonna see in the course of this, um, PCI says to log, okay? Um, ISO 27000 says to log. There are no details of what to log. They don't even mention the CIS benchmarks as a place to start. And they sure the hell don't say the Windows logging cheat sheet, which you really should use because they exceed all the industry standards, right? You have to figure that out on your own. But if you're logging something and the auditor says, see my logs? It looks good, I see a dashboard, I see colors, I see dials, I see pie charts, oh, okay, you're logging. No, all right? Miter takes you to the level it says, I'm logging and you have to detect brute force, for example. So forget the cyber kill chain, sort of. Attack is more detailed at what you should detect along the, the cyber kill chain. There's also pre-attack, but I'm not gonna talk a lot about pre-attack, uh, the, the, uh, the recon and things go along with that. So minor attack really is cool. I have to say this is, this, it was shocking what I saw when I finally mapped what we do to minor attack. So what is it? Um, again, the word framework in the word matrix are not how MITRE uses the word. Um, I will use those, a lot of us use those because we don't really have another word to use. But their, their term is adversarial tactics, techniques, ampersand, common knowledge, which spells out the tech. Uh, it's a curated knowledge base, but we can't really refer to it as a knowledge base when we're trying to apply it, so. But that's what they created, right? It's a model for cybersecurity ad adversary behavior. This is actually what the bad guys do to us. And I can vouch for fighting the Chinese that if I mapped WinNTI into the attack matrix, yeah, I can totally tell you, yep, they did that, yep, they did that, yep, they did that. And so if you had gone through what I'm about to talk about, you would have been way ahead of potentially catching the WinNTI group in the gaming industry. And again, attack is useful for understanding security risk against known adversary behavior. That's the key piece here is it is, it is about what they're doing to us, okay? In a lot of ways, this is also what pen testers do to us. So uh, I'll lump them all together in regards to what you're trying to detect for, but again, if, if Marcus is running tests with his tool against us, um, and he has in his tool items that have attack related to it, then the goal here should be, I should be able to detect threat care or a pen tester, or better yet, the adversary. There are 11 tactics. Here they are down at the bottom, right, all 11 of them. Uh, there are 283 techniques. I'm gonna walk you through just one and then what we've done with it as well. It does cover the base operating systems here and you can articulate you know, NICs into any, any uh, OS Unix related stuff. Um, but 11 tactics, 283 te techniques all across the board. Here's the main ones. I mean, in initial access and execution and persistence and privilege esque and defense evasion and credential access, which we're gonna pick on, uh, discovery, lateral movement, collection, exfil, and command and control, right? This is, they're 11. They're probably gonna grow this, I'm guessing. Um, but the idea is try to get this law lumped into some categories, which is where this, they've done a lot of good work here. Um, this is a snapshot of the matrix. That's what we refer to all this collection of stuff. Now I've highlighted some application security things. By no means I did this, I just really just went, yep, that's AppSec, yep, that's AppSec. And everything in blue, um, this is from their MITRE navigation tool, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it is extensive, so the 11 tactics on top, all the techniques below that. And yes, uh, what you're going to do is map this because this is what adversaries are doing to your system, okay? So you need to take what tools, capabilities, 
Even if it's a manual process that you go around your organization and literally look at script codes or whatever it is, if you can fill that bubble, then you have a capability and you should map that. But attack does require some basics. Um, I know Robert Hansen, if he was here, he'd really like this next statement. We were just talking about this earlier. Um, I, I call it achieving totality, right? So you have to do the three C's. And this is a problem because how many people here think they're really good at, at, at uh, asset management, okay? So this is, the, this is the goal here, coverage. So think of it like, uh, like wall to wall carpeting. Coverage is there's carpet and it touches all four walls. Okay, completeness, is it in every room? Configuration, does it have foam padding below it, the right foam padding? Does it have the tackless strip? Is it connected correctly? And better yet, did they sweep all the nails and crap off the floor before they put all this down, which is what I found in my house when I ripped up all the carpeting and then made them redo it all. So you do have to take in the three C's into account in order to get totality. And after they were done, I finally had good wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Okay, but that's what we're talking about. Asset management, you, you've got to be able to see every host. You've got to know your ghost assets. You have to have the ability to find your ghost assets. Um, you have to understand what the impact of the technologies you have are road warriors. Well, I splunk all the things. How do you get that splunk data when the laptops have been out of the environment for two months and you don't have a gateway allowing that to phone home? Oh, yeah, I've got a gap there, you think? So that's what you have to think about, okay, when you talk about this coverage. Completeness, if you're putting agents on the box, are they on the box? Are they running? Yeah, I can see the agents, they're all on the boxes, great. Now, did you turn on process command line logging? Did you enable the policies that are required for this tool to actually do what you think it's supposed to do? So if you manage to do these three things really well, as you hunt, uh, Robert Rodriguez, Cyber War Dog, and, and Devin Kerr did a talk about this at, at B-Sides Charm or, or one of the places I've seen them. Um, uh, besides Vegas, they also talked about it, so look up those talks, where they talk about the fact they did this hunt and they found they were looking for a specific run DLL32 and some malicious DLL. The problem was they found run DLL32.exe, but they didn't have process command line, so their configuration was off, so therefore their hunts were short, therefore they did not have totality, and because of their configuration was poor. So that's an example. We do, as we do this, must take this into account. I also say the 80-20 rule is real important here. I can't tell you how many times I see people or hear talks or, or hear people complain about, I, I just, I can't do it everywhere, I can't do it everywhere. Time out. We gotta quit thinking we have to be perfect. Uh, Rob Lee, if you, if you wanna watch a SANS video to really crack you up, Rob Lee at, at SANS 3rd did something I haven't seen since uh, probably high school. He literally had SANS bring out an overhead projector and he used markers on the plastic and wrote out the points he made for the presentation. Man, that was, that's like, what, 80s. Um, and one of the things he came across in talking about uh, ICS controls was, okay, I want you to detect these four things. He says, we need to get over as an industry of saying, we must detect these four things or we're not doing it right. And I completely agree with him when he says, that's wrong thinking. If I can see one of these things, it's an indication that I have potentially these three others, but I'm not very good at it. But this one thing's a pretty good indication I got something going on. So look at it as an 80-20 rule, and Devin Kerr reminded me based on the actual statistics, it's 74-26, because as you approach more of the 80% of detection, you have to accept more false positives. So thank you, uh, Devin, for the math on that one. Um, but yeah, that's, the reality is it's an old saying, and that's what we use. Oh, lunch reminder. All right, well, it's all to go to lunch. Time, done. <laughs> so don't get hung up about this 20% or 24%, 26% and quit trying to be perfect. I can tell you from doing Windows logging, which is a lot of things, and I got examples. I can show you my phone of where I triggered some stuff last night, and I got four alerts. Any one of those would have triggered me to investigate the thing that I triggered. And that's what we have to realize is, again, when you're trying to say, I, I can do this, but I can't do this, you have to think, okay, will that lead me to potentially going to look for that manually? If the answer is yes, then, then you kind of are, are on your way there. So let's get good at the 80%. That should be our goal, or 74% if you're doing the actual math because false positives are a bummer to your SOC and, and analysts, right? You don't want alert. And, and, and let's definitely stop using the word alert. If they're notifications, call them notifications. If your people have to do something, those are alerts, okay? So the alerts should be very actionable, and that's a, what you're trying to achieve is that 80 or 74%. And you will improve over time. Do not think you're going to get this right the first time. This is a cyclical process, right? It's a cycle of, you know, lather, rinse, repeat over and over again. So let's look at an example. Tactic, credential access. So here it is in the actual uh, big-ass uh, MITRE paperwork. 
And we're just gonna pick up brute force. We can all relate to brute force and application security. Um, I obviously can relate to it in regards to uh, being a defender. And of course, there's password guessing of brute force, there's credential dumping, there's keystroke logging, there's off the wire, but there's all these things in regards to how credentials can be stolen. So what your goal here is from application security perspective is, do you have a way to detect Kerber roasting? Okay, I've tweeted out exactly a Splunk query for this very thing, for example. Um, do you have the ability of looking for exploited credential access? Are you looking for success logins, not just failures? Uh, Egypt mentioned this years ago at DEF CON, where hardly anybody in a room probably have 7,000 people, like a handful of us raised their hands. Like, yeah, who's, who logs in is really important. Um, whether you have a good pass filter DLL going on or even using one. Right, so all these things are related to the credential that you as application security must address. They are somehow referenced in some way in OWASP, okay? So the tech ID, uh, tech ID is T1110, credential access, I'm specifically looking at brute force. So you get an ID, that means this is your identifier, think of it sort of as a Windows event ID. It's the ID that says that is credential stealing brute force, okay? And then it tells you nicely that it is, you know, from the tactic credential access, that's the high level 11 bullets. It tells you the operating systems in which they have data for, so you understand that. It tells you uh, what data sources, these are the things that defenders would look at. So as uh, web app sec people, you would go look at your authentication logs to detect brute force. I've got authentication logs, again, member completeness coverage. Do you really, do you really have it on all those internet facing servers that somebody's pounding on? Do you actually collect the failed and successful logins? If the answer is yes, you're partly there. Now can you detect when somebody's brute forcing you? Uh, on, the on the last podcast we released, it was about an, uh, an MSP friend of mine shared with me another MSP's client breach where they, uh, their EDR failed them. They think it failed them, it really didn't. Uh, because the people broke into their environment via RDP, found their system management software, utilized the permissions of the management software and turned off EDR everywhere. That's not a failure of EDR, okay? So that's a brute force failure of detection right there because they should have seen that someone was trying to guess the passwords of the logins of the VPN with an admin account. Worse, right? So that's, that's what we're after here. This is how, this is how it's built. Both. If you have a series of 50 and then you have one, you know that they guessed and got in. So yeah, it's the combo, right? You have to think about this as part of building your defenses. Uh, they give you examples, right? The groups that used it. So this is the malware management framework. I used to tell people, go read these reports, pull out of it that they created a new service. Okay, how many people here are monitoring for new service creations in Windows? It's like one of the only default things that Windows does a good job at. It's crappy, by the way, it starts and stops of third party services, but if you add a service, it's really good at detecting that. For example, it also, whoops, it also detects, uh, good for background information, right? So the tools are kits, they have the Lazarus group, they've got tool kits, so yes, you'll see PowerSploit in here, you'll see those sorts of well-known kits, and the kinds of things, Metasploit will be in here, et cetera, to, to give uh, kudos to our Austin groups. Um, and again, no different than what I was telling people with the malware management framework, is read these reports and pull those artifacts out that I can take to a tool and, and monitor for something, same concept. They also provide you some mitigation uh, examples. Again, no details here because mitigation for a WAF or a firewall or Windows host or Linux host is far different. So they just basically saying, you gotta figure out with what you have, how you're gonna mitigate this. And more importantly, in my aspect, being a blue teamer, detection. How will you detect this? So they give you an overview of that, all right? And there's some references as well. So they have places where they've referenced other people's stuff. This is where, for example, they mentioned the uh, Windows logging cheat sheets. So again, what about AppSec? How does this apply to us? I've, I've given you lots of examples. Um, you're right, your goal here is to map the tools you have to what I call an attack matrix. I built a matrix. It is a spreadsheet with all the stuff. And then basically what I'm doing is I'm deciding, uh, and I say start out with red, yellow, green, gray, and white, right? White means I got nothing. Gray means I got this, but we're not doing anything. Red means, yeah, we're bad here. And yellow, you're accepting that you need some improvements. And green, you think you're okay. Move on. That's as far as you need to go the first round. Uh, watch Roberto's talk in regards to the gradient of scale and maturity and all that. Um, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna look through all these things and you're going to take those technologies that you're gonna go for, the, your, your web app stuff, and you're gonna say, I'm gonna color these. Do I have the ability on all my internet, remember asset management, on all my internet facing systems, and then you can work internal, obviously go high risk first, move into low risk and map and decide whether or not you can do these things, right? Now here's an example of, again, the, the smaller version of what I selected from that big slide. 
of, of items that are AppSec related. So exploit public facing application. Do you have the ability of detecting this? Yes, I have a WAF in place and we got logging up the kazoo so I can really see them beating on stuff. Yes, I look for SQL injection of, of cases of special characters and whatnot. Cool, so you decide you're gonna mark that box green, right? So this is how this works. And you'll go through these and you'll decide which ones for application security space. Once you fill this out, whether you turn them all gray in order to determine that these are what I'm gonna identify, and then the team goes through and says green, yellow, red, or gradations of colors, however you wanna do it. I'm sure Marcus would use pink, yellow, and purple, but you know, it doesn't matter, whatever colors you like. Um, but then you start going through and saying, well, how good am I in this area, all right? And then you start color the, coloring these in. Uh, MITRE does provide a navigator tool, which is where this came from, and I'll talk about that, but it allows you to select colors so you can do this and then export that JSON or XML. So MITRE attack, if you wanna know where they're at, and, um, again, it's, it's an ampersand, uh, that's actually the wrong character. It's not that character, gotta fix that. Hold on, let's fix that. Let's fix that. No better time than now, because that'll really confuse you when you start Googling. There, all fixed. Really? I fixed it. I can't see that button. I know how to do it. That should do it. Yeah, exactly. Denial of service. Sheesh. All because of the ampersand. All right, um, so this is a good place to start and a good place to map, right? To, to again, map your detection, prevention, and hunt activities. Yeah, even at AppSec we hunt, right? We test our applications. So what is it I'm looking for? I'm testing at, you know, SQL injection, et cetera. So um, this is what you wanna do, right? Not enough details as to how. You and what you do in your process procedures and what your people do is the how, and you have to decide what you're doing there. And then you'll stick in your web proxies, you'll stick in your WAFs, you'll stick in your IPSs, your network tools, your code scanners, and you'll try to fill in all the gaps that you possibly can. And then you're gonna have an idea of all those techniques of where your gaps are. And suddenly you now have a conversation with management to say, uh, yeah, the bad guys are attacking this area, we got like nothing to cover it. And of course, please add your logging. Remember, I'm Michael, I'm a logaholic. That, there you go, Some, one of the guys in training gave that to me. Um, I just, okay, I, I have trainees with a sense of humor, so I have to use that in Fresno's. I did it again. I'm not changing it this time. <laughs> what if that was a font translation between the two laptops? No, because that character's the same. No, that was just late night, I guess. So let's look at Windows logging. My personal favorite, right? Because everybody knows I'm a big Windows log guy. Um, most techniques can be mapped to logging, uh, especially uh, if you have log management like a Splunk or a Humio or an Elk or a Graylog or whatnot. Um, uh, log rhythm, sponsor out there. Um, you know, add Sysmon. Sysmon is an additional service you can put on a Windows host to collect other things like hashes or prosecution executions. Uh, the big thing I recommend people do with it, which is, by the way, huge in the attack matrix you're about to see for what we did, is DLL, uh, module loading. That is a, a big thing that, that Sysmon will give you. WLS is Sysmon on steroids. It's a government-based project. It's a sys, uh, syslog agent replacement. If you're really interested in, in super detailed, very verbose, Lots of license uh, violating uh, tonnage storage kind of solution, but uh, the new plants use this stuff. It's called Windows Logging Service. So look that up, the link's in the Prezo as well. Um, Adlog MD Pro, we fill some gaps that logging does not because we have some non-log related items. And any tools or scripts you have, your Python stuff, whatever you're using. And then again, something you will definitely need to do is how do you go ask the system a question? Uh, you have to add some sort of query tool for the OS. Um, this will be, in my case, I love Big Fix. Uh, but you were talking Dataniums of the world, we're talking OS Query, Google Gur, uh, Ka uh, Kafka, uh, Kanza, um, things like that, right? Things I can go ask the question, you know, is the configuration correct? You know, I have to go check that, um, that sort of thing. So you need to be able to query the system, that's real important. You add your network tools, you can fill your other gaps, and boom, and then see the previous slide for the web app stuff, and, and then we go through it. And this is what you get. So we release as part of the Sans Thur talk, uh, the Windows attack, uh, I got it right there, right there, I got, I got it right, just wanted to say. <laughs> we launched the Windows attack logging cheat sheet. Um, this is designed, again, it's very large, it's legal size, so when you print this, it's like 16 pages, it's, it's extensive. Um, but what we're doing is we're telling you the event ID and the type of thing that they're saying we look for. These are the data sources on the, on the right, as opposed to the tactics and techniques and the number. So I had to actually, in the API, then split out. The data sources are in one, one block, so I had to split them so I could say, well, 
You know, that's not the same as that. And then you basically start filling them in. Now, if you are capturing 4688 process creations, everywhere in that matrix then, well, obviously, you'll be in good shape. If you're doing process command line, line logging, even better, because now you see what people type after the command gets executed. The gray indicates I have no covering in regards to Windows logging, because again, collection of, uh, of clipboard data, yeah, there's nothing in Windows logs to do that, right? There's nothing in Sysmon to do that. Um, another one down here, what is the uh, data from information repositories? Yeah, okay, authentication logs. Um, I'm, I'm thinking application logs, not 4624s here. Um, and so you start building this. And what we've done is said here, for Windows, um, and there's more to be added to this. I've got advanced logging stuff that I have to add to this, so there'll be some improvements, but this was version one. Um, and this is what you do. You go through and you start color coding it. And then uh, in this case, because we have other technologies now being added to it, right? Just Windows logging is the green and yellow. Um, here's an example of the DLL monitoring that I'm adding to enhance the, the logs for, for side loading, for example. Um, Sysmon, the DLL module loads are really, really useful. Um, again, causes your licenses and logging to go up. All the blue is the LogMD stuff. So this is non-log related data. Everything on here is collected by LogMD. But I'm splitting out what's based window logs, what I'm enhancing with, with Sysmon, and what I'm doing with LogMD. You would do this with your WAFs and your code scanners and all the protections and things that you guys do for web app. And this is where the colors, the different colors will come in. So by filling in out the tech matrix, and your capabilities, you begin to understand what you can and cannot do. And that's the goal of what Miter Attack's trying to get people to understand. And again, they're mapped against the techniques the bad guys are actually using. They're designed for what Marcus's threat care tool does and what pen testers do, right? They took that into account when they were doing it as well. And again, um, I was shocked, and I mean shocked. When I started doing this, I expected logging was gonna be mediocre or, or half-ass at best when I came across this. When I got to 80%, I was just like, Wait a minute, what? So in all windows, and then if I was to expand that into you know, server logs, app logs, authentication logs sitting on the internet, my VPN logs, my OA logs, whatever. If I was expanding into that, then I'm, I'm in really good shape. I was like really surprised. If you do logging really, really well, you're gonna be 80% covered to detect the techniques that the adversaries are actually doing against you. Yeah, but they can clear the logs. Yeah, they can, but they're gonna make noise on the box before they clear the logs, and if you go log management, Clearing logs isn't gonna do much good. But I honestly was shocked, which is what generated creating the cheat sheets and release, releasing them for everybody's uh, use. Um, but again, I've been practicing malware management for years and I've been fighting the adversaries for years in Chinese, so they taught me a lot. I mean, they really taught me, they really refined the fact of what I thought I knew to the fact that, yeah, this is what you did. So I was ahead of the game and I knew what the value was because the logging is actually what caught the Chinese. It wasn't all the security tools. They got by all of them. Um, I can show you how to get by Tripwire, for example. The Chinese knew it, and they executed their code in such a way that Tripwire never detected it. Um, and, but our logging did, right? So thank you for a good logging in Windows in 2012 and beyond. So suspicious PowerHell, PowerShell, PowerHell. Um, so this is an example of what we do in regards to trying to detect malicious PowerShell, meaning, okay, PowerShell is mentioned in the attack matrix, I, and it's a technique that they use to do things, whether it's recon or info gathering, it's mentioned extensively, quite a bit, within the, within the matrix. And so I'm like, okay, I have to be able to go out now, it's one of my duties, and one of my things that I need to detect. I not only need to log it, but I want to go hunt for it. Whether it ends up in log management or not, whether I'm executing it with the Kansas script, whether I'm running logmd, it doesn't matter. And so here's an example of logmd output, I'm trying to go after that specific thing. This is obfuscation. So have anybody seen Daniel Bahannon's talk on DOS obfuscation or, or PowerShell obfuscation? The goal here is to catch Daniel. I showed this to Daniel and said, yeah, good luck getting by this now. So what we're doing is we're looking at the things that are happening within PowerShell. This is a 4688, so process creation. All these other event IDs outside of 48688 are PowerShell logs. So I'm collecting the process creation, which is all over the matrix. I've got process command line, which is giving me the details to, say, to see the fact that minus ENC is being executed. I've got the PowerShell logs being collected. I've got them turned on to the level the cheat sheets have, so I'm getting module loads, I'm getting all the script block logging, et cetera. And now suddenly I can see things like a large block size of PowerShell code is executing. And I've got 264 pluses and 138 ticks in my PowerShell code. Yeah, that's never good, okay? And so now I can definitely paint that picture, that, that box green anywhere I'm looking for malicious PowerShell if I, my coverage is everywhere with this kind of technique. And I did publish 
these kinds of examples in the Splunk logging cheat sheet. So there are some queries to do that. Um, in this case, we would consume this with uh, our log management to get it into Splunk or Humio or whatever. And the other thing I can see, the buzzwords, right? Dictionary words, this is where obfuscation comes into play, where this would break this. But in this case, this malware did not do it. Um, this was an Emetet infection. And you can see web client detected, so they're doing a download. I'm also looking for HTTP, and I'm also looking for the word download. So I have a buzz list of words in the settings file that allows me to look for whatever combo. If they obfuscated this, I may not see this because I'll never see the buzzwords, right? The dictionary test would fail, but this would light up like a Christmas tree. And then the cool thing is some of the obfuscated code in a 4104 events get deobfuscated. So if you boot PowerShell Base64 on me, when you get a 4104, it deobfuscates it. And so now suddenly the buzzwords will work again. And so the combination of these things gives us a really strong potential of detecting malicious PowerShell happening in our environment when Marcus tries to run some stuff. So what kind of tools do we have available to us? Uh, the MITRE ATT&CK Navigator is a place you should start. Play with this. This is where you'll understand as you play with the attack matrix on their web page where you can just start picking the things out and start highlighting them on the web page and color them and code them and everything else. And they have an export feature. Now what you do with that afterwards is, is up to you. Um, I'll talk about how I did it and got to those spreadsheets you saw. Um, but this is where you'll play. This is where you'll start playing with it, understanding where color coding comes into play and where you'll come up with your own color codes for different technologies. You know, WAF is maroon and, and logging is green and you know, whatever scenarios. And again, map them to the technologies first, worry about color gradients second, right? Just try to identify, I do have tech, theoretically, whether it's working or not, that will that'll address this area. But the attack navigator is really good for this. Um, here's where you find it. Um, again, GitHub, attack navigator enterprise. Attack did, and I have not looked at it, released a new uh, website. So I'm sure a lot of this looks different, but again, um, I think the, the, the URLs will be the same. They just did a, a much better upgrade. They also can do mobile. So in regards to people who do a lot of mobile work and do mobile app development, this is Austin, so there's probably a, a fair, fair share. They have a, a, a mobile navigator as well, so you can map to mobile type exploits, APKs and all that stuff. Um, and then pre-attack, the idea behind that is more of the other things that happen before the adversaries or what they're doing to gather. You know, what kind of things can you, can you look for? For example, what do you see about your company on OSINT? And that's the kind of stuff that's covered in pre-attack, so that's there as well for you. Um, this is a really interesting project. I, I like what these guys are doing. So um, even though the name here, they're not really a SOC, uh, they sort of are. They're a managed arc site shop. But uh, SOC Prime also offers the ability to subscribe to queries on various <coughs> platforms. They've got arc site, Splunk, Greylog, Elk, um, somebody else I forget. I'm trying to get them to add Humio. And the idea here is if you subscribe, so let's say I'm looking for Spectre meltdown queries, I don't have any. You could subscribe to, Splunk, uh, to Sock Prime and actually go download the queries from these various platforms. And if one platform has it and the other does not, they're utilizing Florian Roth's uh, project to convert the query from the native query language to a generic Sigma signature that you then can convert to Splunk, for example. Um, and they've mapped these out as well as with stuff they have. So here's an example where a person who provides logging services and, and subscription information to their clients for logs, for log-related queries, has mapped to the, the matrix, allowing you literally to see what they have, go click on it, some of it's open source uh, Sigma stuff, other stuff they created for their clients and they charge for it. Um, they're asking us to help them feed data as well, so we might be feeding this kind of information into them and, and having subscriptions for it. Um, but it's a pretty cool idea. I like where they're going with it. I think this is really what we're going to start seeing with a lot of vendors. Endgame, for example, has mapped all their stuff to, to the attack matrix. This is what my EDR can do for you to fill the holes in the attack matrix. And I think this is going to become pretty common for a lot of security tools. Um, matter of fact, I was having a conversation out here with the Jamalto folks. For example, you could literally take the attack matrix, fill it in for all the things your products do within that tax matrix, and put that in your presentation so I know what gaps it's filling for me when you talk to me. That would be very powerful because now we're talking the same language. How do you fill in my attack matrix for me? How do you help solve these open gray or white boxes? Um, threat detection marketplace is what they call that thing. Um, and again, they're based on not only the actual queries from the log management solutions, but also they have a, a Sigma rule converter they offer for free. So if, for example, if I took one of my big ass queries and I wrote it in a Sigma search and I put it up on the Sigma uh, GitHub site, they consume that automatically and it will be available for you to download in the free 
area of SOC Prime. If I want to build a whole bunch of my queries that I do with Splunk, and I say, but I'm not going to just give those anybody, and I want to charge five grand for the entire suite, um, they have all kinds of service offerings. So there's the ability now of kind of this app sense of, of the term of queries. So I kind of like what they're doing here. All mapped to attack, and I really like that. Um, and, and they have the most extensive list of, of logging solutions I've seen in this scenario. And the converter is something worth considering. You will not get the detail level that we do, like in Splunk, with all the lookup tables and everything else. Uh, for example, the Sigma query for uh, violation of a bits admin misuse is literally does process execution have, you know, event ID 1 or 4688 have bits admin.exe and a slash transfer in the process command line. Right? If you have that, you now can see that bits admin's trying to attempt a transfer using application whitelisting bypass, et cetera. And that's how simple the query is. But very easily built in a Sigma rule. Um, all subscription-based, but they do have free options as well. Unfetter and Tanium. Tanium did a nice blog, so I'm putting that out there. Again, one of the things you need is a tool to query the operating system. Um, so this is kind of important. Uh, Tanium guys always give me, give me crap that I don't mention them enough. Um, I do, and they're definitely a viable tool for querying and doing stuff like this. Um, and so they have a really good article here. I, I thought this was really good um, in regards to dealing with how to map to, to attack. Uh, another good article I found on getting started uh, with the uh, attack matrix. Uh, the Sigma stuff is the conversion, so please go look at that with Florian Roth's project. The thing that I used to create those spreadsheets was the API. So fortunately, MITRE has an API. The nice thing about this is now I can write, and again, Cyber War Dog, um, uh, Roberto, has the scripts. You can go down and download the PowerShell scripts where I queried the things that I wanted. And so once you modify that to your needs of the things you want, you can just run a new query for those categories, pull them in, and now they're in a CSV format that I can suck into Excel or whatever tool you want. Uh, the only thing I had to do is split that one data source into, uh, I think it was 12. Uh, in order to get them all separated so I could then do my, my detailed color coding. And so there is an API, which means you can integrate that with just about any tool you want, right? So any way you want to pull that API data in there and suck it into some platform, uh, you can do it. Um, and Roberto and Cyborg Dog there, he, he's uh, uh, definitely done a lot in this space. Um, there's also uh, mappings to the MITRE pre-attack stuff that's available on GitHub, so you can kind of see what's going on there. And then again, uh, interesting article I just came across this week. Uh, about a brute force example with attack, and this person was literally blogging about how they went about looking to see if they could detect brute forces mapped to the MITRE framework, and he actually kind of uh, blogged his experience. I thought that was really good because that happened to match the subject that I was talking about today. So I added that there as somebody's real world effort to go through it so you can have an idea. So some recommendations. Some say uh, in hunting to create a hypothesis. Don't start there. I am not one of those advocates that says start with a hypothesis. I say first start by eliminating what you know you can hunt for and that you don't have. For example, I'm a malware guy. I definitely want to know if there are any keys in the registry of a Windows box that's over 20K. There's about 25 of them. And I filter those out because I know those are, good, those are normal keys to be that big. And I want my entire environment to be clean of those large keys. I just eliminated scripts and payloads being stored in the registry of all my Windows boxes. I know I can do that. It's easy. It's built into LogMD. I can do it with Big Fix as well. So I know I can eliminate that. All right, I'm good. Now let's go fill those boxes in in this matrix that I did that. I also know I can scan the entire WMI database to look for any payloads or scripts or things like that. Um, so I can color that one in. OK, but I can modify the already existing current VBS.VBS script, which doesn't modify the WMI database, but adds my bad code to the existing current VBS.VBS, which is in all of our corporate environments. Yeah, but I can hash that file and do a compare, which means I got that covered too. If there are any scripts in the WMI database, hash them and make sure they don't change. If they do, investigate that. Because it's another way, uh, Devin Kerr said he saw that a lot at Mandiant, where they just modify, they look at the WMI database, they see there's already a script there, and they add their bad code to it. So if you go hunting the WMI, it looks fine. The reality is they modified the thing that's actually calling. So you have to watch out for those things. And I eliminate this from my environment. I say, I don't have these things. Auto runs, I baseline all the auto runs. I'm like, okay, these are all the good auto runs. Now I'm gonna monitor for auto runs once a day, once a week, once a month, however you wanna do it. And I know I don't have that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna monitor process creation, process command line 4688s in the C users directory. 90% of all malware starts there. Okay, I can do that. I just took out 90% of all malware infections that I've seen in my entire career with those four items, okay? 
So eliminate what I know I don't have that I can do, and now I can start building hypotheses to try filling the rest of the gaps, okay? That's the approach, because a lot of us have tools that can do many of those boxes. Don't create a hypothesis, just go do that one item you know you can do, and that you can prove you don't have this bad condition, mark it off, move on, then create a hypothesis. I guess sort of the way of doing those four things is a hypothesis, but hypothesis should be something like, I should probably go around looking at the PowerShell logs for any signs of encoding. That's an example of hypothesis, which again, we've done a LogMD, so we can do that too. Um, and then build more of them, and then map your capabilities to attack. Start filling in that, that gap, right? Where all the gaps are, start filling them in. Start color coding them. Start identifying potential budget pitfalls. And literally, if you wanna go through this really quickly and just do it off the top of your head, you're gonna have a place to then have a discussion with your manager to say, I did this like in an hour or two hours or however many hours you want to spend on it. And all this gray stuff, I don't have anything for. Maybe you can ask the other team to see if they have something for that. But this is potentially a huge pitfall for us is I don't think we have tech to cover this. I got nothing covering blah, 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 whatever it is. Mail proxy, web proxy. Um, so can you help me convert, you know, and then you've suddenly started a budget conversation for next year. Uh, for Windows logging and login be related stuff like Sysmon, uh, we have two, uh, two freely available malware archaeology um, cheat sheets now based on attack. So those are available to you as well. Give you examples of what I mean by going about and doing this and having the color codes. And Roberto's stuff takes it to a whole new level of maturity. He's definitely focusing on the maturity level. Um, so the conclusion is minor attack is great stuff. Uh, this is the best government related type of project. It's a, it's a not for profit company, MITRE is. So please donate, please contribute. Um, this has gotten the attention of a lot of us in InfoSec. This is really good stuff. Um, I am, I am, it really finally puts, puts a map to the way that I've been doing InfoSec for probably the past 10 years of saying, well, what do the bad guys actually do to us? Not what theoretically some talk says, I could theoretically do this to you, but this condition must exist and it must, yeah, the bad guys could ever get there before I'd ever detect them, right? This is really what they're doing to you and they've gotten away with, so it's really good for that. It finally gives us a way to measure what you can actually do. Can I detect this adversary behavior of brute force on all my external web servers? And did I prove it? Okay, for example. And you don't have to get detailed at first. Please don't get caught down in the weeds. Go through iterations of this. Quickly go through it like in an hour or two or three or a day. And then start using it as a goal and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna you know, every week I'm gonna spend a few hours in this trying to make sure I can go from gray that I've identified, this is my area of coverage, and I'm gonna to try to get that gray to green or identify it to red so I can have a conversation with you. We suck at these areas that we need to improve on. And I need budget, people, scripting, tools, whatever, to do it. And you know, start off with simple colors. Um, Roberto's thing says, take green and then turn it into shades of green to measure your maturity, right? The, the whole 5P model of product, people, process, you know, all that. So you can, you can go that route too. But that's making the problem a little bigger in my opinion. I don't think you should start there. I think you would do that after you complete this and you think it's pretty good and your team consensus is, this is pretty good, this is what we can and can't do. Now let's look at our maturity and that's what you're gonna rinse, lather, rinse and repeat every year to keep this going. Expand it once you map it. Time, you're gonna get better over time. You start adding technologies. But it's good to know you can't look at this area. So when you go investigate something, yeah, I got nothing for this area, so how are we gonna do it? You gotta go straight to forensics mode. Ugh. Okay, it's called Dave Cowan up at GC Partners, bring him down, we got some forensics to do. I, I just can't do this, I don't have the technology, I don't have the people, so I've got a gap and I just know now to outsource it, for example. But get to know this framework. That's, that's a conclusion I have for you. This is, a, this is good stuff. Additional reading, uh, my Prezo, um, uh, is posted up there on Malware Archaeology. The, this is the fastest way to hunt Windows. This is my SANS uh, threat hunting incident response talk. Uh, they will post the video in three to six months. Thanks, SANS, for being so uh, detailed on that one. Um, again, all the other PDFs of this con were shocking on how much MITRE was mentioned. It was really eye-opening to me that, hey, I'm not the only smart guy that thinks this way. It's everybody else here, so that means I am actually smart. Um, at least that's what I thought when I left that conference. It was really a surprise that I got that much out of a SANS 30 minute talk series of, of talks. Uh, 30 minutes is a really hard talk to do. If anybody's done one, it's, it's tough. Um, quantify your, your hunts. Devin Kerr and Roberto got together and have done several besides Las Vegas, et cetera. I don't know which ones they got recorded. These are two I know they did. They're somewhat based on both of these. Um, Again, uh, the heat map that Roberto did, uh, some of that data is kind of built into this. But those two have done a lot in this area. Endgame with Devin is doing a lot. He's basing all the endgame solutions towards attack. And Roberto, being a consultant for, for uh, SpectreOps, 
um, is doing the gradient and maturity of this and, and building it. And he did a, a phenomenal talk of how the detail level of event logging occurs um, in regards to the attack matrix at the, uh, at the attack con. Um, so uh, definitely watch that talk. And again, uh, finding other related attack techniques. This is a, another article I found out there. It was kind of cool, so read up on that. And uh, with that, I'll take questions. And questions get rewarded with a cool little show swag. Questions, come on, somebody's got something. Have you hooked up your response? You're gonna like this. Have you hooked up your, re, uh, your SIM or your response monitor so when an alert goes off, you got red flashy lights or a lava lamp that goes off? Yeah, uh, not yet, but my phone does go off. I can show them to you on my phone. So, almost. What, what do you think, I'm John Strand? <laughs> I was wondering if you've seen any, or you've had any feedback from Microsoft in terms of adjusting their defaults or, you know, I love that you have this guide out there, but it kind of feels like some golden defaults might help everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked at HP. Uh, you don't know how many times I got this in regards to turning on default, because uh, HP, uh, Bastille Linux is a hardening tool for Linux that existed years ago. Uh, matter of fact, one of the guys works for SpectreOps or one of, the, one of the companies now that I used to work with at HP. Um, and we used to constantly get asked this by the clients. Hey, can you turn this on? Hey, can you turn this on? Uh, Microsoft themselves have done the same thing. We're not going to do this. You have to make the decision and group policies where to do it. I have harassed them about their uh, upgrades of Windows 10, where I, if you go to my, if you put the cheat sheet in place on a home system that's not controlled by GPO and you do one of these upgrades, it will disable the task scheduler log. It'll wipe out your registry auditing, your file auditing, because they're putting back the sec edit policy of default back on. Um, they themselves, apply what I preach. They do command line logging throughout Microsoft and they apply it through group policy. That's their answer for everything. The fact that they're breaking these things in, in upgrades, I've made them aware, I've provided them the proof. And luckily, because when you first run LogMD without any parameters, it'll show you everything they broke in the upgrade. So I even told them how to check for it every time they do it. And so far, they've not fixed it. So yes, they made aware of it. I wish they would turn it on, but they really believe it's up to us because they don't want to like break things. And they've been telling you to turn off SMB 1.0 for two and a half, three years knowing that ransomware thing EX was going to happen. So um, they told you to do it. Um, but no, they, they don't seem to want to do that. It's a good question. Hey, uh, two, que vendors. two questions. Uh, first, thanks for presenting this. Big fan of MITRE and the framework. Um, so would you recommend uh, that organizations uh, align with this at the expense of not aligning with another popular framework like NIST CSF? And if so, you know, are there gaps in MITRE ATT&CK that are focused on maybe APT with, and it has blind spots for things like potentially background checks for internal employees for insider threat? What are your thoughts on that? So uh, first question, uh, this compared to NIST anything. Um, I, I dealt with NIST a lot. So if anybody wants something to go to sleep to, 863 is a great read. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the TCPIP handbooks, right? Uh, very detailed and whatnot, but consulting by the pound. Um, they need to be more specific. To me, this is more specific. In the case of, I was a big proponent for ISO, I tell people ISO over NIST any time. Yeah, but we have to do NIST. Okay, people have mapped it. So what I see happening here is at some point, government will add more to 863 and do a mapping to attack. And just like in the back of NIST now with the ISO mappings and the HIPAA mappings, there will be attack mappings in my opinion. Somebody will take that on. So in that aspect, yes, because I think they will bridge that gap with mappings and then deal with it that way. Um, the areas that they gap in this is more of a physical security and process security right. type stuff. Right. Uh, that is something they can add. They have asked and requested feedback and expansion of MITRE ATT&CK for these very things. So by all means, yes, make those suggestions to them. They are open to that. It is a viable attack mechanism. You know, if Jason Street walks in, how do we treat that? Um, there should be some basis of physical security and maybe they make a physical security matrix. Um, but they do want the ideas. They definitely want the community to help out and, and recommend changes. So please do, if you have anything you think's a gap. One came out this week, uh, they saw that um, uh, successful logins was not in the lateral movement technique. Well, duh, it really should be. And so a perfect example where MITRE should add that technique to lateral movement because yeah, you definitely want to watch that Marcus just logged into 50 machines on the same subnet where the DCs would not catch that because he's using local creds, right, yeah. or, or a Metasploit scenario. So yes, submit those improvements and requests. Yeah, and, I, and I've spoken with them about other frameworks and they're super bright and super open-minded and patient, so they're cool. Um, so second follow-up question. So um, for example, for several techniques you listed, 
uh, data sources, we'll, we'll take as an example process execution that of NID 4688 and you know, using that for multiple different techniques. And so I think what we're doing is we're finding a data source where we can get events of a security significance, but there's some additional analysis or correlation required of those events to uh, differentiate something that's um, benign and, and authorized from something that's malicious and unauthorized. And so do we then, you know, so we have to comb through the 4688s to find something of interest. And at that point, are we not applying threat intelligence to say, well, these are the kind of things I would find in the event which may, would make me be suspicious or correlated with other events. And if that's the case, have we arrived back where we started, where we're going back to indicator-driven uh, analysis as opposed to, you know, techniques and tactics? So. Yeah, so a good point, because I tell people to collect, you know, 4688s. And they say, wow, I just did that, and there's a lot of data here. Okay, now look at C users, start there. And okay, yeah, but I got GoToMeeting, I've got Mozilla, I've got Google firing off, I got all this. Okay, filter that down. So yes, you have to go through this iteration and maturity of that event ID or consideration. And then, uh, you know, execution A isn't necessarily bad unless condition B occurs, like maybe in lateral movement. Um, if I use application wireless bypassing to do something, but there's no process command line associated with it, well, are there logins? Uh, actually, my talk in WMI that I gave at DerbyCon is a great example. Uh, WMI by itself is, if you were to just say, I'm going to watch all of WMI, you're going to get a lot of normal noise. Um, there is a unique correlation that occurs with WMI exploitation on Windows 10 and 2016 server is that it authenticates twice on those systems locally. So therefore now I know somebody's trying to authenticate in a way that WMI does not normally do and that combination is suspicious. So yeah, you have to build that correlation. That's the part of this that's missing. Um, there was a suggestion at uh, AttackCon that uh, we as a community pick something like OS Query as an open source project. Um, it's not real strong on Windows, but he was focusing on the Windows side, meaning there's certain things. Right? It's, it's, a, it's oddly enough you're querying Windows using a SQL language um, to, again, remember I said you need something to query the system? And he's asking for the community to actually create the queries and come up with a place and a thing to build this massive OS query database of these kinds of alerts. So we kind of do that correlation in these queries um, as a potential option here. So I can see this effort uh, maybe with the Sigma SOC Prime stuff, that that correlation could be offered, sold in some way. Well, and so with the, with another MITRE framework, with Sticks and Sidebox, Fix already now has integrated MITRE attack to some extent, a former yeah. MITRE framework. And so with Sticks, you can express the combination of multiple elements, and Sidebox, you can express specific indicators on the strings and text, regular expressions and the like. And it's been rewritten in JSON to make it easier, I found out last night. Oh, oh, yeah, we were just talking about the fact that it's XML. I just go, oh, please, why did you write it in 1990s tech? So, yeah, JSON would be much easier because then it's native for the log management to consume, et cetera. So, yeah, Sticks and Taxi also made by MITRE the ability to interchange the information between tools. Uh, Sticks is the, uh, the pieces and parts, and Taxi is the transport mechanism. Um, integrating this, obviously, back and forth would be a good thing. And that will also help in some of this as well as people build these, these rule sets. So, yeah, you do have to do this correlation. You will have to kind of do the two things together. And I think that's where Roberto's efforts, my efforts in releasing the cheat sheets. Um, again, the next question I got when I released that, one of the questions I got was, have you built all the queries for these? <laughs> um, I have basic queries for these, but what I write in Sigma will not correlate quite in Splunk, so I'd have to, I'd have to take two basic queries and do a join. Um, and so there's, there's effort to be had here. I, I would really like the fact that the vendors, like a Splunk or whomever, would consume that and make it as part of their solution, it would make our jobs a lot easier. A good question. Anybody else? I'll be around, so hit me up. And anybody ask me questions, come get a, a, a pop out, adult fidget spinner.